Hey, Gwilym, how are you, mate? I'm really, really well, thank you. No need to talk about my shirt. No, it's, now, it's such a shame, isn't it, that it's an audio-only podcast, because you are resplendent in... Is it... Are they trees and... It's quite... It's kind of Hawaiian, but it's also got a, a primal scream vibe from the album cover they did. Can I, can I just make out Maui written on it? Is that... Is that... Maui written on... It's not, it's not because of the current disaster. Yeah, I, did, I, did, I didn't know if it was some kind of like fundraising um, effort you were doing. No, maybe I should change the shirt. Maybe we should take that bit out now. <laughs> we haven't done the we haven't done the chat thing for such a long time. I um I can't remember how to do it. How have you been? How's the tortoise? Now he's. Do you know what I was thinking about him as I was getting ready for the podcast this morning? Yeah, he's he's cool. We've had an offer to put him out to stud. How great's that? Good for him. Yeah, we. I, I don't know whether you you're in them, but we're in one of these um sort of community well, face com, you know, community Facebook groups. I think it's a tortoise swinger group. No, 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 but it's turned, but it's turned into that. So, um, so, so you, you know the sort of thing. Generally, it's just my cat's gone missing, then my cat's gone missing, mm-hmm. then another my cat's gone missing, then mm-hmm. someone who might want a sofa removed or some such thing, and then randomly a couple of days ago it was um, we're really interested in breeding our female tortoise, but we don't have a we don't have a stud. And it was like, whoa, get in there, Albert. Was it was it his only fans page that first caught their attention? <laughs> Uh, I, I can't afford to shell out for one of those. Oh, uh, a bit slow on that one. So yeah, no, yeah. So that's the that's the exciting developments in the uh, in the world of Albert the tortoise. Is he's going to be a um, he's going to be a, a, a star. Still, it's um, yeah, it, it, film it, are you? No, no, they might film it. I'm not going to film it. Just... Oh, okay. So um, yeah, how how cool is that? Lee Davis and Willem Roberts are the two IPs in a pod. And you are listening to a podcast on intellectual property brought to you by the Chartered Institute of Patent Attorneys. Anyway, crack and podcast today because we are talking about now. I don't know whether I should call it and whichever I say, I'm going to stumble over it because um, generative AI or whether we're talking about chat GTP, which considering I've been saying CPTPP for such a long time. I struggle with the T and the P in it's chat GTP. GPT. G, G, what? It's GPT, not GTP. I see. I'm getting it around the wrong way already. Well, yeah, I'm just really because only because it's written down in the in the chat here. But yeah, GPT. So, so there, there you go. G, G, chat GPT. Anyway, we have a person guest on the podcast today, friend of the show, as in he's been on the show before, who can tell us everything we need to know about chat GPT, including how to pronounce it and whether we should in fact be talking about sort of something more generic such as generative AI um, because of course chat GPT is just one of the ways in which the technology has evolved. So um, Niels, hello, how are you? I'm fine. Thanks for inviting me back to the show. It's, lo- it's lovely to again. So, so Sorry you've been um, kind of sat there bored with talk of tortoises and the like again, but um, ho- hopefully you'll forgive us for that. So, so uh, reintroduce yourself for people who don't know you. Okay, sure. And and you've you've just put in front of me quite a hurdle because I'm a German and how to pronounce chat GPT in English might be the first task I, I fail with. But uh, other than that, I'm a partner at Pinsent Masons placed in uh, Germany, as I said, in Frankfurt. Um, and I'm focusing on everything that is digital. Last time we talked about NFTs, now it's chat GPT, digital assets. And, and by heart, I'm a copyright lawyer. Just came back from a lovely holiday on the Isle of Wight. So, um, oh, no. yeah. You were 10 miles and just the Solent away from me. You should have said I'd have come over and bought your beer. Next time. I'll certainly be back. <laughs> Before we get onto the serious stuff, where were you on the island? Um, in Ventnor, uh in Bonchurch, to be precise, lovely place at lovely. the uh, yeah. southern peak of the island. But we we travelled around. I've I've two little, little girls who enjoyed that, and it's, um, it's, not, yeah, that, it was it's good. not that big. It's not that big, is it? So anywhere on the island, you're really anywhere on the island. Yeah, and we even cracked twenty three degrees once. Whoa, whoa! <laughs> For summer I'm, vacation, brilliant. <laughs> I really hope you managed to do the absolutely um, mad waxworks museum that there is over there, where nothing actually looks like what it's meant to look like. Uh, no, we, we've been to Osborne House, we've been to Tapnell Farm for the Aqua Park thing, and of course at the beach and several other things. That's probably on the agenda for next time. And also, um, 
if you're a fan of cooking, uh, the Isle of Wight is the UK's largest producer of garlic. Um, oh, yeah, we went to the garlic festival. You wouldn't yes. believe this. <laughs> Gwilym's just sat there sort of thinking, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Gwilym, you need to do the garlic festival. Okay. Think a smaller version of the Jersey Battle of the Flowers sort of thing, where it's just all about garlic. Okay. Exactly. It's tasting, celebrating. All of that. Yeah, all of that. Yeah. People dress up as garlic. Yeah, of course there's some of that, yeah. Some do, I didn't. So it's sort of a, sort of a garlic clove in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, no. So, let's, so anyway, anyway, to the meat of the podcast, having discussed the garlic of the Isle of Wight, chat GPT, I need to say it slightly more slowly, then I get the, the letters right away. What is it? <laughs> I, I will warn you i will warn you i've had a little play so i kind of know what it does okay i i, I do try to be uh, uh, to describe it as simple as i can it's a chatbot so it's um a system a dialogue system you could say to allow communication between man and machine um not all chatbots are um resting on on AI or generative AI. Some simply talk to you based on a database in the background, but this one is able to learn. And this is what AI is about. Um, and maybe just to, to give you one further clue, some people talk about AI and others say generative AI. So what's the difference? I think you, you need to start with that. AI can be built into a lot of uh, things. If your if you're, um, fridge knows how much stuff is in there and then uh, learns about that, how cold it should be inside, that's AI and there's no generative thing in it. But if you create by using AI images, videos, text, whatever, that makes it generative AI. Okay. And this is chat GPT because you prompt a question and it comes up with either um, a text, which is your answer, or it even can create images, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the generative piece in it. Cool. That makes sense to me now. Cool. So one of the things that I struggle to get my mind around is, so it's, is whatever is behind chat GPT, is it like permanently connected to the internet and always kind of doing research and sort of working in that way? Or is it always looking at a static kind of previous body of research and drawing its sort of intelligence from that? How, how is it how is it coming up with the solutions to the problems or the questions that people pose for it? Right. Um, it, it's a mixture, to be honest. If, if you create an application that uh, rests on uh, generative AI, you need to pre-train it. And we talk here about a large language model, which was pre-trained with all sorts of uh, data. And this data was used up until um, or it, it, the um, date, the cutoff date was uh, September 2021. Right. So the pre-training, in order to bring something to the market like ChatGPT, you need to invest in writing the algorithm, learning or uh, allowing to create an artificial neural network, which is the, the engine, you can say. And yeah. then you train and train and train and train this. You need tons of data for that. And at a certain point, you say, OK, now I have a product that I can put on the market. And that's what they did. Now, as we have many, many people now using it and, and prompting information into the system, um, OpenAI, which is the company behind it, would be mad not to use that information that comes in day after day after day to also train and continue to train the the engine. And that's also what, what is happening. So we have a, a pre-training stopped in September 2021. And then you have whatever you, me, uh, Willem, whoever put something that is also used for a continued training, which means if you want to be something uh, want to have something very accurate you probably are better off pre-September 2021. But yeah. there is some additional learning that is continued as we speak today based on the prompts people put in. Got it. Okay. So I'm, I'm trying to make that make sense in my simple mind. And I'm thinking about it along the lines of kind of like a root finder or sat nav or something like that. And then it's got a, it has a, mm -hmm memory at a point in time um but then that is increased in the future with the new data that comes in so yeah so yeah so think think i understand that let me give you let me give you maybe one example 
if if you plan an event for your company or so, and you need to come up with a nice speech, you can prompt in a lot of information, and ChatGPT will uh, write for you a very eloquent speech. If you want to know whether in the hotel where the event takes place is still a room available, ChatGPT might not be able to give you the answer because nobody else prompted that information into the system, and they then ChatGPT will say sorry call at the front desk and ask it will actually tell you that will it it'll say you know you, you need yeah you need to go somewhere else for this i'm i'm i'm, I'm not the expert yeah quillam have you had a play no i haven't i'm a bit scared of it scared why are you scared no i've read some at the very beginning oh don't be careful once you're in you can't get out or something like that but it's mostly um i don't know i just never quite get around to, to pressing the buttons which is pathetic and i should and i've got lots of points and questions about it both the personal and the professional level but i know you have played with it lee yeah so i um there, there, there are a couple of reasons why i play play with it so let, I'll, I'll tell you two different stories and then it's probably time for you to then butt in and do some work on this podcast with them as well so the the two most recent reasons i used it one was because i was needing to do some work for super needing to do some policy development stuff it related to stuff that i had worked on previously between 2005 and 2009 and I thought I'd be lazy here I'll just put what did Lee Davies write about blah 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 and of course it found everything I'd ever written about it and it came up in a sort of like really sensible way that was so it was it was my work being played back to me there was some stuff in there that were that, that was from other sources but by and large it was my stuff being played back to me so it just it just worked as a as a memory for me and gave me sort of like path to tread and one of the other things that uh, that i've experienced recently is that I, I work in the membership association space and we have like annual award ceremonies and stuff like that and uh, an award ceremony i was at one of the associations there had been really really successful. they didn't win everything but they've been really really successful at being shortlisted for everything so I, so i just said to the chief executive of this association you're gonna have to give me a secret about um writing submissions for awards i said because you know no one else has been shortlisted across every category like you have and he said yeah we just did it on chat gpt simple as that we just we just asked it to write awards nominations around the categories and uh, and it did it for us and we just needed to tidy it up so that, that, yeah those were my two most recent experiences so i've seen my kids uh, using it lots and it worries me some of the cheeky things that people are using it for just in terms of when i get stuff now i think hmm who wrote this but i'm getting my head around that um and actually to clarify the reason i've not used it printed is because currently i either work look after a baby or sleep that's one of the main reasons I've not done to tinker which is one of my kind of fun question actually what I am hearing is a lot of really creative uses of chat GPT a bit like when Alexa came along then you had to sit there and think what stupid question can I ask Alexa you know the dogs eat grapes or whatever it might be Neil what are we seeing in terms of creative use of chat GPT beyond speech writing and less writing letters of introduction and job job applications and stuff which you hear about more and more what, what are people doing with that? It? Oh, it's it's a very wide range of things people actually do. I mean, there are coders who have their code now written by ChatGPT because as a language model, it cannot only come up with German, English, Chinese, whatever. It can also write code. So that's one thing. In the media world, you have scripts for short video sequences, be it commercials, be it all types of marketing language, which is ChatGPT is used as a starting point. I don't think that many people don't look at what the output is and just throw it out as their own work, but it's a starting point. People say, well, I have no time to read all this thousand pages of this book. I need to have a summary. Give it to me. So it's big volume of pages condensed into an abstract. It's the other way around. You have bullet points. You need to talk about something, make a speech out of it. You have private life. You want to go maybe to the Isle of Wight or a bigger island and, and say, what are the places you can visit within a fortnight? And then it comes up with an itinerary. So the use of that product is not limited in, in the same way as you can always come up with another question for Alexa. Yeah. Well, funny, I, should, I sent an email to a fairly high profile IP person, won't name them, and they accidentally sent me the email trail between my email and their response which included, here's what ChatGPT has suggested as a response to Mr. Roberts' email. <laughs> How did you feel? <laughs> um, I was uh, mostly amused, actually. At least I got a response, but it was just, it was funny, the human error on top of generative AI is quite an, quite an entertaining combo. 
Because because what we're hearing a lot of people say, and I've seen a lot of people saying, "Have you seen what it's doing? It's rubbish. It's rubbish. People are still better." A little bit. I remember when I used to go in London black taxis, and they used to mock the GPS for going down all the wrong routes. Whereas now they can just use it because it use got, it, yeah, got better. So Niels, where are we on the curve of how effective and how useful generative AI slash chat GPT is? So it's just yeah. beginning on it. It's, it's going to go up and up, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, people do tend to have very specific attitudes towards language models in general, and notably chat GPT. Can it be humorous? Can it be funny? Can it be emotional? All this what thing, all attitudes that are more or less in the human sphere. Is it, can it be copied? Can it be reproduced by a computer? We need to understand that chat GPT is continuing to learn. It will become better. And it only was launched end of last year. So it's a baby. What we then need to also take into account is language models like ChatGPT are not about correctness. If you ask me, is it good or bad? We need to first think about what is it meant to do? It's about eloquency. It's about coming up with something that reads well, that sounds nice. It's not about 100% correct output because that there is no level of or no no checks of correctness built into the system it's eloquency when you ask me where are we at the you know, on that curve the output can be quite compelling if you are prepared to put in adequate amount of information so the better the prompt the better the output if you want to come up with a speech on your company you need to put in a lot of information about what your company is doing in order to allow the chat GPT algorithm from what is already known to the system from earlier training plus your prompt to come up with a very nice type of entertaining speech you can even have it in a verse form a poem chat GPT can write poems so yeah, it is good. It's very compelling, but it depends on how you prompt it. Does this give rise to questions around as we're sort of working our way through slowly, generally around AI as creator? Does this give rise to questions of ownership? Because, you know, if I put in a theme for a poem and chat GPT comes up with something, I then play around with it a wee bit. Have I genuinely created something or is the author <laughs> somewhere else in the, in the ether? Yeah, that's a very important question and it has been in debate uh, ever since ChatGPT was launched. First of all, ownership, you, ra- you really talk about copyright. Are you the author? Is it your copyright? Yes or no? If you prompt something in, the way this is produced, the text is nothing that compares to a human author writing a certain piece because behind ChatGPT there are roughly 8,000 tokens of four letters each and those tokens are process of stringing together these tokens on calculation of the best way to continue this word this sentence in order to come up with a compelling text so this is repeated and it's an auto regressive process that starts every time you prompt something, you start, it, it's new. So it's purely by the artificial neural system and not by you as a, as a person prompting in the question, the author. So what comes out is purely computer generated. And therefore, under German law, for instance, you can't own a copyright to that. It's not protectable. Contrary to that, in the UK, in principle, there is a clause in the in the Copyright Act saying computer-generated products can assume copyright protection. So it's each country or the EU, speaking from an EU perspective, decides whether this is possible or not. Now, in the contractual piece, so in the terms and conditions between you and OpenAI, they say, whatever you create, it's yours. That's fine. But it might not allow you to claim against any third party a copyright if not, you start with the text, uh, which what with the output, and then work on it and have your human input added to what was the starting point from ChatGPT. Then, of course, it's the mixture. And if you put enough 
of your own original human input in there, then you end up with copyright protected work, which is yours. There's a parallel question on that as well about the training inputs. Yeah. So maybe not chat GPT specifically, but generative AI in particular. There's a, there's a legal issue in the Getty image specifically saying you can yep. our data, we own some copyright here. And then there's kind of an interesting parallel with, for example, I think we've talked about it before, Lee, kind of some of the music cases knocking around where musicians told that they copied something they had no awareness that they were doing because it's a fragment of memory. But I know that is turning into quite a big issue as well, isn't it? The kind of people saying, well, hang on, my content's going into this. I want something, I want something back. Yeah, indeed. Because there are a number of lawsuits pending, notably in the in the US. And even the New York Times announced a couple of weeks ago that they are considering to sue OpenAI because of the articles from uh, from New York Times that have gone into the pre-training of chat GPT. So there are issues that OpenAI is, is confronted with. But you need to differentiate in which shoes you put yourself. Is it the user that it's using or who is using the algorithm right now? Or is it OpenAI who developed the piece and is operating it? So, so you need to look from a legal perspective on the various stages, the development of the model, the training of the model, the operation of the model. And then the creating of output and the using of output by the users. Now, your question uh, goes to the training phase. And of course, if you want to end up with a well-trained algorithm, you need to put in as much data as you can from all sorts. And that's what OpenAI did. They had an all-in approach. So there was copyright protected material. There was data that was personal data, trademarks. Everything went in and they simply said, well, we rely on the fair use example because exemption, because what we do is we use it and we throw it away afterwards when we have our tokens, when we have trained everything. And this training purpose, we are justified to do that. And this is now what people are challenging or companies are challenging. We have one case where they say it's a theft of data because they used also from miners text that was written in chats from miners and they used it and they say, well, this is not under the exemption. You should have asked permission. You haven't done. So it's illegal what you've done. And OpenAI will need to defend against all this and say, uh, and the argument is, yeah, well, we didn't infringe. We didn't need to ask because we were entitled. It was justified for the purpose of training. And there are the legislator in Germany, in the UK, elsewhere, they have considered that we do need, in in order to create this type of software, that you need to have access to big data. And therefore, there are exemptions under European copyright and other uh, jurisdictions have similar things for training, for using big data for text and data mining. And this is simply what, what people do. However, as one who wants to rely on such an exemption to stay within the boundaries of this particular exemption of this law. And the lawsuits that are pending right now are exactly about this. Did OpenAI comply with that? Or did they use the exemption that is existing in an overreaching and therefore illegal? So that's the training phase that causes all this trouble right now. So we have a a minister now for AI in the UK. By Karen Camrose, Lee? Yeah, like I think, yeah. Yours, I think. You're great. Mm-hmm. You hang out. Yeah, that's him. By, by Karen Camrose. Yeah, he's... Um, oh, and it's, it's interesting because I know that there are conversations going on between the minister and the UK IPO and others about data mining and whether it needs to be more closely regulated. So um, it's, it's yeah. a really live discussion at the moment. It, it is. And not only there, not only in the UK. I mean, we have the same uh, discussion about the AI regulation in the EU, which is in the trilogue phase. So very close to be finalized and enacted on a pan-European basis. And they started all this with, with the attempt or with the aim to create legal security by having the right level of, of, of regulation in place. Because for open AI, all these um, lawsuits they jeopardize the success of the overall project. Because if you were a big company and you were going to license from OpenAI the GPT engine, you would like to know, is it legal what you did in the phase of creating and training this thing? So is it a license worth 
paying a lot of money for, or is it not? And this legal security needs to be in place, and therefore we need further regulation at the right level of rightly balanced. Let's put it that way. I would say. I mean, I I would say that we can have all the lawsuits and all the regulatory like. I would say if your data is in the public domain, as we say in English, Niels, the cat is out of the bag. <laughs> I mean, yep. what is what's the German equivalent just for our education to that idiom? Was einmal in der Welt ist, kriegt man nicht mehr raus. What's in the world once, you can't get it out of the world anymore. There you go. Thank you. A little bit of a like, language there, Chris. I think I prefer the cat coming out of the bag. It's, it's kind of more visual, isn't it? But even so, quickly, Neil, uh, uh, Lee, chat, type into chat GPT, a better idiom than cats out of the bag. That's all we get. <laughs> um, so I think one thing that a lot of people, I mean, everyone is actually probably worrying about, is the longer term, medium to long term impact of this on our jobs. And Interestingly, it's come up in our, in a, as a patent attorney, there's a lot of uh, stuff coming to us now from third party providers offering to do a whole range of stuff from reviewing file histories and looking for added matter issues, specialist points, sorry, through the obvious one, drafting patent applications and a whole bunch of stuff about anal- analyzing other people's portfolios as well. And an interesting early insight is that several clients as in patent users, have said, please do not use AI on our product because we don't want it to be used as a training tool. So it's funny how currently that's, and I can see that certainly for obviously anything that you know, new patent application is by definition can't be in the public domain. So training on it is a bit dodgy. But it's interesting how, again, I just wonder how those pressures are going to work out in the long term and whether everyone's just going to start accepting it. Yeah, very good point. I can uh, share with you a little anecdote. Um, the other week, I was speaking to my PA, and she came up to me and said, "Oh, Niels, I saw this this great seminar that is offered to PAs how to use ChatGPT. May I enrol for that?" And I was like, "No, please not." I was quite surprised that these offers are out there because, as lawyers, we do need to keep confidential what our clients tell us. So this is a real big issue about confidentiality. If you put in a prompt, as I mentioned earlier, you need to be quite rich in terms of information in order to get pleasing output. So whatever you put in there is in the system. You can't, the cat is out of of the bag, as you just put it. Now, um, so there is a, a little jigsaw. On the one hand, we want to have tools that continue to learn. This is what AI is about. But if you want those tools to learn, you need to do your own thing and and help the system learning by giving information into the system as a company. And it's with law firms, it's a particular thing. We are quite an extraordinary animal in that. But take any other corporation, any other entity which has trade secrets, which has certain information sitting on file, which shouldn't leave the premise. Not the digital premise, not the physical premise. It should stay where it is. Now, and this is why a number of companies, including Bosch or the very well-known drug store chain DM here in Germany, they have licensed from OpenAI or any other offer the engine and built their own company-owned and ring-fenced DM GPT or company name GPT. It's quite a costly thing to do because these licenses aren't cheap. But what they do safeguard is that they can put in or that they can allow their employees to put in all the data that might have confidentiality issue with it and to use it in a bubble, in a company bubble. So that's the big ones go that direction. And others have already announced to also take uh, to go down that path. The smaller ones, they are really tricked because either they allow their employees to use it but need to implement very strict regulations on not to put in sensitive information which then will jeopardize the quality of the output or they can ban it altogether but what they can't do is just let it go because if someone isn't aware of that risk as an employee the risk of doing the wrong thing and putting in information that shouldn't end up in the system is quite high does that cover your question to some extent really helpful kind of the the other follow-on is again on the kind of what about my day job concern a quick step back i reckon this is the fourth major uh kind of transformational change in my career potentially affecting my job oh tell me about the first three then number one you're gonna love this number one was email (laughs) okay 
Number two was paperless and the recognition that we needed to go digital. And number three, and these are all timings are all crossing over here, was actually the internet. And all three of those had enormous impacts. Um, very quickly, actually, Lee, I think it's quite interesting. I was reflecting on this for patent attorneys. When I started, I was at the very end of the kind of the Victorian era of patent attorney training. I'm not that old, but I mean, that's how long it took for us. Yeah, to yeah, yeah. You know what you mean. Oh, so you've also been at Osborne House then? Yeah, yeah. Well, no, you have to. my my uh, I used to live in Silver Vaults, where the old patent library was, and my job for the first two or three years was checking patent status, getting copies using microfiche of old patents, stuff that was incredibly manual. And then suddenly, that's why I think it's a five-year training period for patent attorneys, because you used mm -hmm. to spend the first three years doing learning absolutely nothing. Although it replaced a large part of the training job, actually accelerated our training was a great improvement, which is which is good news um, on yeah. the. That's the, that was the impact of the internet. Impact of papers, that was good. It took us a while to realize you don't have to have everything written down. You can keep it all. That, that's, that's actually been fairly painless. As an aside, I think the one we still haven't solved is email. I think that's maybe yeah. awful. But by and large, each of those, in the end, has been an improvement to our working lives. Everyone resists it. You worry about it. Hang on. I'm, what do you mean I'm not going to spend two years um, down the library? That was my job. But of course, no, you're going to do patents now. It's great. Do you think we're going to see the same long-term benefits to basically everyone's employment positions because of chat GPT, generative AI, that in the end we've seen? Or what's your projection for where the legal market might be sitting in terms of what a law firm might look like in, say, five years? The answer to all this is, yes, it will change our life, not only lawyers' life. I think in, in many professions, we need to adapt as we needed to adapt to email and, and internet and, and all the other things. So we need to learn from it and then to work with it. It will not go away. And I'm not talking specifically about chat GPT here, but generative AI in general. So we do need to deploy this wisely. It won't replace lawyers. It won't replace doctors. It won't replace any other human profession, but we need to make use of it in a very sensible way. And regulators need to make sure that those who want to misuse it have at least difficulties in misusing it. So how will it change? I think that a lot of support uh, functions will be replaced by chat GPT or generative AI. The human end control will never be replaceable, I think. So it, it really is for us to learn how to make best use of generative AI. AI in part of the process of creating a piece. Lawyers will start working on a contract or on something else like a, a court submission, et cetera, et cetera, legal opinion, by either getting the playing field right by asking chat GPT some general comments to be put out in order to make sure you are on the right path. All this will be one of the tools we already use today laptop, the phone, um, dictation software, translating. Nobody really goes out and hands a piece to a translator anymore. They put it into some sort of a of an application doing it for you within seconds. So so and it will be one of these tools we use. It will be a very sophisticated tool. And those who are the bigger firms will have more access to it simply because it will have remain a quite costly tool to be deployed for quite some time. But it won't replace us. And to give it a little different angle, it's not on only in the professional world, but also in the academic world. We advise a number of uh, very well-reputed universities who struggle with allowing the students to deploy this, because in the end, if it goes to the exams, you don't want to test whether ChatGPT can write a nice article. You want to know whether the student is able to do this. And, and now, as we, as we allow math students to use a calculator, you might allow a law student to use chat GPT in a certain amount, in a certain context, but not allow chat GPT application to write the entire exam or the answers to the exam. So they are in a, in a need to refine their, their rules for examination as well. So it's, and what we do need is that talents can go to university and learn and be those who come up with the next thing that will change our life in a couple of years' time or a month's time, you don't know. Niels, we've talked quite a lot about the um, the legal and some of the ethical issues of generative AI yeah. in the sense of how it impacts on the 
the world of law and, and IP. Can I ask a more general ethical question? You, I mean, you, you may not have an answer to this. I'm not expecting you to be the expert on this, but it's just a, something that goes through my mind. I'm becoming increasingly sort of alive to, concerned about the, the fact that we seem to be in a, in a perpetual series of culture wars at the moment. So certainly in the UK we are. Politics seems to split absolutely down every single line and we're continually waging one one side against against the other whichever that is, issue is is there is there a danger that people who then take generative ai programs who to look for their information to look for their answers for things is there an, inher- an inherent bias in the in the process that could lead to people ha- having their own prejudices confirmed it, i don't even know whether that's a sensible question but it's just what's going around in my head at the moment Oh, it certainly is. You point really, uh, put your finger in the wound, as we say in Germany. In the same way as in social media context, you you run the risk of ending up in a bubble where um, only the information is fed to you that some sort, maybe uh, also uh, uh, steered by um, artificial intelligence, is is matching your interests, and and it's not balance, it's not objective, etc. In the same way, you can, of course, by prompting into uh, uh, chat GPT, false information, again, and again, and again, and again, you can end up that a certain person prompting a question that is in the remit of, of that, um, or in that area where this false information has prompted, has been prompted into systematically in the system, can be furnished with uh, output that re- uh, rests on and relates to that false information that was pumped into the system. As so I you said, can, you can increase the inherent bias in the system by prompting it. Yes, yes, you can. I mean, um, it, it's it's uh, kind of difficult. The bigger um, the group of people is that is prompting questions into the system, the more you need to make an effort to really push a certain area in or a certain information into a false direction. That's s- simply by volume. However, it is a risk. As I said, ChatGPT and no other large language model is about correctness. It's about eloquency. So, and there is no checks and balances as to whether an output is correct or not. And therefore, if you simply believe in everything that ChatGPT tells you, you might end up in the wrong gear. Yeah, yeah, and you can influence. It takes some time. It takes a lot of effort. But also, this you don't uh, you don't don't imagine a hundred people prompting. That can be done by machinery as well. People have tried to influence elections in the U.S. or elsewhere by prompting into social media false information. The same um, ratio can be applied to a large language model. It's not about correctness. Yeah, yeah. What's on the horizon? What do you think will be the next logical developments, either in the systems and processes themselves or their application? Good question. I mean, first of all, as I said, um, ChatGPT is uh, uh, still a toddler and it will will continue to be around and it will learn and will be more eloquent um, and people will uh, and more and more people will, will use it or equivalent um, language models um, that will come up. Uh, or are in the course of being developed. So, so that, that's, I think, the, the development we will see. Second, we we do see with the uh, um, draft EU regulation on AI and other um, legislative projects being uh, in the pipeline that the legislator, as always, when you have a technical development, will try to, to catch up and will try to set a framework, a regulatory framework. And the questions you've just raised and, and uh, Gwilym has posed uh, to me, those are also the questions that the legislator needs to answer and that they are already considering. So we will have, at the legal end, um, um, a continued uh, a net of regulations that will improve and improve so that in the end we try to allow people to benefit from the good things, but also to safeguard that there aren't people who misuse. There are high-risk AI applications that are regulated at, in first place now. That's the focus. ChatGPT won't fall into that because it's too, too general. But we do see a development and a discussion how to make sure that those aspects that can lead to false information that can 
mislead people that uh, we, we reduce the risk by legislative means. Technically, you could think about whether a check for correctness could be built into language models as ChatGPT. In principle, the answer is yes. You can always add an, another layer of algorithms that check for correctness. Will you end up with 100% correct output every time you prompt something to? Certainly not. I think people do consider whether this could be, again, the technical reduction, uh, um, technical means of reducing the risk of mis misuse. That will take some time. People discuss it. Probably there are some clever uh, programmers already, coders already somewhere, I don't know where, who, who test this type of stuff. But um, that's probably one thing that we as a, a society need to, to maybe also call for, because otherwise we will end up in, in, a, in a situation where you can't trust those language models, even though they are so eloquent. And in the end, that's not good for the internet, not good for us. But it's only a prediction. And that's probably the perfect place to end on that prediction. So <laughs> thank you so much for sharing your time with us again. I probably should ask Willem if he's got any more questions first, though, because that's a bit rude of me not to offer him the chance to come back in again. No, no question. You've got an anecdote. you got an anecdote. Oh, go on then. It's an anecdote. Don't worry. <laughs> it's a random one. Which is a mate of mine who runs quite a big financial organisation, kind of shareholder level stuff, had to do the annual report. And he thought he'd type into chat gpt giving me a joke for the annual report to the investors and he said he had to filter hundreds of bad ones that made no sense and we kind of you can see why the machine might think they're a joke but he got to one in the end that he did actually tell and got a huge laugh which is that i asked chat gpt for a joke for the big shareholder meeting and it said just look at the investor report <laughs> <laughs> quite a good joke so um it was it, it got there in the end interestingly and, and, and if you can see i mean chat gpt can come up with good jokes it's not these things where you think oh that needs to be come from a human no it's it's about eloquence again i am um, i did pop um give me a better idiom than the cat is out of the bag from uh as soon as you prompted me to do it into chat yeah. Yeah. gpt and it's come up with a well kept secret is no longer draped in camouflage. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sophisticated! <laughs> I don't actually understand that though. I'm trying to break that down. By the way, do do you have the uh, idiom uh, "Don't buy the cat in the sack"? Don't in the buy back. the cat in the sack. Yeah, that's when when talking about cats in Germany. The Katze nicht im Sack kaufen. Don't buy something you don't have analyzed uh, sufficiently because the cat is still in the in the bag and therefore you can't see it so don't buy it so that's when when bags yeah, yeah, and yeah. cats well, are we, at issue we, we must have something similar but it doesn't immediately come to mind horses and teeth horses yeah maybe so yeah no maybe not skip horses and, i don't know yeah i'm sure we do god as well yeah but it goes in the right in, in the same direction i guess i mean you get a bag that's wriggling it could be any it was not gonna be a tortoise it'd be too slow but it could be not gonna be a tortoise no <laughs> We need, we need to do a podcast on idioms, just on idioms. It'd be amazing. Um, anyway, we're, we've run to time, but you know, Nils, that we usually end up on a sort of like a tangential question. And and Gwilym has gifted me one. So Gwilym talked earlier about the four in the end, things that have changed the world of work for him and decided that they were all positive in one way or another. So Gwilym, to you first, what's one thing that's changed, could be in the world of work, might be in sort of in your kind of more personal life, that wasn't for the best? Some technological advancement that actually you wish would just go away. Oh, it is email. It is email. It's email as well, is it? I think it's solved. I honestly think that it's give it's a mental health issue for a lot of people. Um, managing your inbox is horrific. The the immediacy of it, and it's it, it's too old in the sense that when it came along, nobody knew where it was going to go, and it wasn't really designed for where it is now, which is the main medium of communication between people. Generally. And then, of course, it doesn't even work with your kids because they think you're mad to use email. So you also have to contact them through Call of Duty or something. So yeah, yeah. email, did it, it, it was never, it, it, it was designed without a purpose and now it's just chaotic. So I think most of them may not be alone in this. I think it's it remains catastrophic. It's awful. Yeah, no, I, I think I would agree with you on that. 
it's interesting. So my youngest, Evie, she's 16 today, funny enough, and I'm just about to go and do present unwrapping with her and all of those interesting things. Um, I, I, I needed to send something to her. She went to a festival at the weekend and I needed to send her the tickets. Uh, so what's your, I never even thought to ask her before, what's your email address, mate? What? Yeah. <laughs> she said, yeah. what WhatsApp it to me, Dad. <laughs> Yeah, I had to tell my kids to get email addresses when they started going for jobs. Yeah, I had to use sentences, and then they, of course, now they just use bloody chat GPT, and there we go. Nils, you've had lots of thinking time. What what technological advancement do you wish would go away? <laughs> well, well, um, Gorm just took away from me the the email. I come up with uh, because of a, a very ad hoc problem I have the trampoline. <laughs> come on, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want no more? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> As I said, we came just home from from vacation, and and first day, and we we still have summer vacation here in Germany, so all the kids are uh, not at, back at school. First day, Monday morning, five minutes into the trampoline hall, my eldest daughter Merle, twelve years old, twisted her ankle, called me back to hospital on crutches now, ligaments torn. So who? The hell invented trampolines? It's for me no good use. <laughs> That's a very topical, but um, yeah, I think yeah. one of my son's friends, who's uh, ten years ago plus, still is has got issues with his arm because he thought it'd be an amazing idea to jump off the roof of the shed onto the trampoline on a space hopper. Oh, that. Actually, Not a good outcome, I suppose. Everything about that's awesome until you land. <laughs> it all went very badly wrong. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, but uh, the thing is, it's now six weeks without sports, and my girl needs to be active. So it will be for me six weeks of painful. Yeah. I want to do become active again. Blah blah blah. So um, yeah, trampoline it is. What about you, Lee? Yeah, so so for me, it would be, I have a thing about drive. I've never had a new car in my life. I only ever drive very old cars because I used to, 20 years ago, like playing around with them and tinkering with them and, you know, changing a carburetor out for a bit of improved performance and stuff like that. But now, so I drive a 20-year-old car now, but it was one of the earliest cars to have computer management systems and all of that. So I'd get rid of the engine management light because I have no desire to know that my exhaust has just produced sort of slightly over the requisite amount of emissions or the, you know, the spark on number four cylinder fired intermittently for 0.3 of a millisecond. You know, not interested in all that sort of stuff. And this thing just keeps popping up. And every time I plug the diagnostic tool in, it's always something that I can just kind of delete and move on from. I didn't need to know those things when I drove a car without an engine management morning light. Why do I need one now? So that's yeah, I, I would I would bin that thing off. <laughs> Good one, Nils. Thank you, thank you for your time. It's been brilliant again, as it was last time. Grillum, yeah. always good to see you, mate. Look forward to see you on the next one. I have pinged another um, idea for a future podcast into the chat to you. Should I just rehearse it here slightly or not? I have, and then I'll tell you. Then I'll read up my response. Yeah. So I, I think we need to get three guests on and do an IP room one hundred and one. Where I don't, I don't know whether you have something similar in Germany, Nils, but in the in the UK we have a both a TV and a radio show called Room 101, which I think is in some way, shape or form related to Orwell's 1984. I think, doesn't that feature yeah, in that? It was a room, it's like a rat in a pipe, yeah. So, so, so it's a room to which you banish things that have uh, ruined your life. So I, I think we need to get three IP people on, and maybe Nils could be one of them to come and get rid of their worst IP nightmares. And your response was? Yeah, watch out for IP format rights. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> I'll call it Dungeon 102 or something like that. <laughs> Check the trademark rights first. <laughs> it's where you face, they make Winston Smith face his worst fear, which is rats. And that, that's how they get him to basically declare that he doesn't love Julia or something. I seem to remember. I love yeah. that. Yeah, but, that's yeah, been a long time. Just find an alternative oh. literary thing where you have to face your worst fear and just call it that and we're good. Call it that. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Thanks both. Thanks a lot. That's a wrap.